Good morning. The Federation of Cambridge Residents Associations, FECRA, was set up in order to give residents a voice on planning matters and to be a voice of scrutiny on the quality of life in Cambridge. Today, we comprise over 90 Cambridge Residents Associations and neighbourhood groups, plus other community associations and individual members. That's a powerful civic voice. As Dame Fiona Reynolds, the former head of the National Trust, now master of Emmanuel College, argues in her recent book, The Fight for Beauty, beauty is not a luxury we can only have when we're rich. It's a way of shaping the changes we need and want so that they make a positive contribution to everyone's lives, as well as protecting the things and places we most value. To succeed, we need to be clear about our objectives. Beauty, sustainability, and genuine public engagement must be at their heart. Residents want to see those objectives being integral to decision making. Cambridge is often described as a compact city. It's a city with a village style of neighbourhoods, human in scale, small enough for people to feel they can make a difference. If someone says they live in Newnham or Romsey, people have an immediate picture. Community life is characterised by a style of relaxed, informal connectivity and a rich cultural life that is not dependent on money. The collegiate influence of university life has been an integral part of Cambridge's success. <coughs> Asked to describe what makes Cambridge special and a good place to work in, residents refer, of course, to the beautiful architecture of the historic centre, but they talk just as much about the green spaces they experience on a daily basis, the city's attractive tree-lined approach roads, its meadows, fields and river, and its pattern of open spaces, big and small. These open spaces are vital to people's well-being, and it's their informal, semi-rural style that people say they like and enjoy. In Cambridge, almost uniquely, the urban and the rural mix and abut, and this is what gives the city much of its character. The city's open spaces and hidden paths, its rivers and fields and water meadows with their long views, give the feeling that the green lung of countryside is close to hand. They engender a feeling of shared enjoyment and ownership of that lung. This is reflected in Cambridge's community life. Local historian Alan Britton writes, Whichever way you approach Cambridge, you see grass, trees, and lots of sky. The college gardens, parks, and commons bring nature <coughs> right into the town. Cows graze on Midsummer Common, just five minutes' walk from Marks and Spencer. In the summer, office workers and students eat their lunch beneath the willow trees that line the river at Cove Fen. At weekends, Jesus Green becomes a giant playing field with games of every kind, from skateboarding to lacrosse. Let's pause for a second to look at this, because this is what we're in danger of losing. All this is threatened because Cambridge is a driver for the government's eastern powerhouse bringing massive new developments right by the city, which threaten the beauty and sustainability of the city and the quality of its community life. What concerns many residents is the speed of development and the way in which it's been shoehorned into this small and exquisite medieval city. There is not enough space in the city centre for all of the bikes that want to park, let alone the cars. Much of Cambridge is a fast, free car park. 
if Mott McDonald's projections for growth are correct, the park and ride facilities are insufficient for people who would like to use a bus or bike to get into the city centre, while river bridges will not be able to cope with the numbers of walkers, cyclists or buses at peak times. <laughs> New development cannot proceed in advance of additional water supply and storage capacity being provided by water companies. Surely, similar rules should be in place for transport. Is there enough water to supply all the development that is planned? Cam Valley specialist Stephen Tompkins has reported that information is not being put in the public domain because of government pressure on the Environment Agency <coughs> to be both environment protector and developer. His concerns about the lack of water and its effect on sustainability, impact of oversubstraction, and the effect on the river environment have been repeated by other water specialists. Cambridge is likely to have problems with surface water and flooding with the scale of development planned. <coughs> what are the concerns expressed by the Royal Town Planning Institute on grounds of water stress and flood risk? Under the city deal, 500 million pounds of our taxpayers' money has been allocated by central government to be spent in the area over a five year period from April 2015 to 2020. But this money can only be spent on supporting growth, and it comes with tight deadlines. Residents find it strange that in the agreement signed two years ago, there was not one mention of the words heritage or historic city. Yet, in 1988, Cambridge was thought worthy of UNESCO World Heritage status. People are urged to fall in love with city deal money. Yes, they would like to do that, but in reality, many feel the heavy engineering schemes being proposed as a solution to Cambridge's transport problems with their proposals for compulsory purchase of front gardens and loss of attractive trees and verges, along with off-highway routes through the Greenbelt, strike at the heart of what makes this city special its beauty and its community life. The flood of university and college development proposals is overwhelming. On one day alone, in the middle of the summer holidays, Cambridge University submitted over 100 planning applications for the vast expansion of its West Cambridge site, all with a huge impact, not just on West Cambridge neighbourhoods, <coughs> but on anyone who lives in and around Cambridge. Questions are being raised about university and college commitment <laughs> to the local plan. But it's not just the speed and volume of development that concerns residents, but the ugliness of much of it. The 20 mile per hour signs <laughs> hit Cambridge streets with a casual vandalism of a small tornado. Verges and trees are being replaced by tarmac and the clutter of street furniture. But planning can help people to deliver the right changes as well as stop the wrong ones. So planners should be friends. In Amsterdam, the team for any new transport infrastructure includes urban designers and landscape architects. An engineer with a clutch of patents and a Queen's Award for Industry writes to FECRA, in 1978, I had two job offers. My fiancée said she'd marry me if I took the job in Cambridge, but no way was she going to Milton Keynes. That was when the Cambridge phenomenon was at its height. If we want to attract the bright young things of tomorrow to come and work here, we need to avoid making Cambridge look like Milton Keynes. People look wistfully at the quality development of the King's Cross area of London, with public spaces, interesting concert halls and galleries and older buildings restored and quality social housing. They ask, where have all the independent shops gone? <coughs> what about the vision of a well-designed transport hub at Cambridge Station that was supposed to be a new gateway to Cambridge and house the Cambridgeshire collection? Many residents and people 
who live outside Cambridge say they no longer enjoy coming into Cambridge, especially in the summer. Why? The city looks dirty and uncared for. Central streets are packed. There are too many day tourists, too many boats on the river, and too many commercial events on the city's well-used open spaces. City roads have potholes, paths have been left untended. People point to the desperate need for social housing and affordable homes, which is having a huge impact on the city's socio-demographic mix. Currently, developers are able to circumvent their Section 106 obligations to provide 40% affordable housing. Instead, they can submit a financial viability assessment in which they provide a calculation justifying why they can't afford so much affordable housing. Even so, much of this affordable housing is outside the reach of nurses, policemen and teachers. Some city neighbourhoods are seeing the rapid and aggressive expansion of student accommodation at the expense of affordable housing for residents. The increase in the transient nature of communities across the board is having a big impact on local identity and neighbourhood cohesion. All over Cambridge, densification is taking place with little concern for design and amenity. The latest case of garden grabbing by Robertson College in Romsey Terrace has left many residents questioning a planning process which was supposed to protect them. Residents <coughs> on the south side of the city have used the word toxic to describe the impact of Cambridge's biomedical campus plans on their neighbourhoods. Advise this institution needs to expand even more and urgently needs nearby affordable housing if the city is going to compete on a global stage, residents wonder who will benefit. Homerton College has new houses for sale less than a kilometre away, but these are being promoted as executive homes for London commuters. Everywhere, green space in the city is under threat. Emmanuel College wants to develop its playing fields, Newnham College wants to build on its gardens. Plans are still on the table, despite the public outcry, for off-highway bus routes impacting Greenbelt on all sides of the city, including the Gogs and the Westfields. The 1947 Town and Country Planning Act stated that human health and well-being, education, jobs, and social provision cannot be separated from people's need for fresh air and exercise and duty. Residents want to see councillors elected who will help them to shape, enhance and create beautiful places, buildings and spaces and reject ugliness. Achieving beauty, environmental stewardship, sustainability, local distinctiveness, quality of life and social inclusion needs all those with a stake in Cambridge's future to work together to make beauty central to local planning so it's not seen as a luxury add-on. How do we encourage local authority investment in the public realm at a time of fiscal restraint? How do we make the most of the considerable resources and enthusiasm of Cambridge residents in shaping their locality? Can we ensure that loved views and walks and paths and streetscapes have special protection. We need a system to ensure this and a public realm strategy suitable for Cambridge. We need city design and heritage champions who will incorporate design principles and good practice. What about green stewards and gorilla gardeners? In Portland, Oregon, America's premier cycling city, they have a system of green streets and rainwater gardens and green environmental stewardship. How do we ensure responsible tourism? Does this require management, for example, with quotas, city marshals, tourism codes about guides and transport and the river? Among the community rights introduced in the Localism Act of 2011, perhaps the most significant was neighbourhood planning. Neighbourhood planning schemes have already been initiated in Cambridge. Can we do better? 
What about urban parishes? Do we need a system of Cambridge friends that can reach out to a wider <coughs> national and world audience of people and protect, for example, the river? As Fiona Reynolds points out so eloquently, we live in a world where the economy and consumerism have become the dominant forces shaping our lives. There is the threat of climate change, yet our vision for the future appears rooted in materialism. All the focus on economic progress fails to understand that the human spirit needs so much more than this. If we all care about keeping Cambridge special, then we need to fight for a vision of this city that is shaped by beauty, sustainability, and genuine public engagement. Thank you.